So colleagues, I think we should start and I'm assuming that more people will join us um, as they move from meetings that have overrun. Um, and I'm going to stop my video so we can focus in on the images of our two presenters. Um, we have with us today for a session on cultural aspects of e-learning in Africa, um, Dr. Wanjira Kinutia, who has worked on learning design projects in the US, Africa, the Caribbean, and the UAE. Um, she has served as an associate professor for many years at Georgia State University, and I'm sure has thought very deeply about issues around the cultural aspects of e-learning because of all the contexts within which she has worked. We also have Dr. Tutelani Asino, who's Associate Professor in Learning Design and Technology and Director of the Emerging Technologies and Creativity Research Lab at Oklahoma State University. Also the founder of Namibia House Club in Clubhouse and the instigator in many ways um, of many of the connections that Emerge Africa has currently. One foot on the African continent, another in North Africa, arms stretched out. Uh, our session today is cultural aspect of e-learning in Africa uh, and it's structured as a workshop. Um, and my name is Tutalani Asino, as was said earlier. Um, and I am always excited and honored to have an opportunity to join Wanjira in any conversation. Uh, Wanjira, are you uh, around to say hello? Yes, thank you, Tutalani, and good whatever time of day or evening or night it is to everybody. And as Tutalani has said, we work very closely together on various things. So this was a pleasant surprise that uh, we were asked to do this. To, uh, and I think it was happenstance, but it was a good happenstance. So I'm happy to be here as well. So um, here's our roadmap for today. Uh, we'll just do a little introductory remarks, which I think we already did. Um, we'll set the stage for the conversation. Uh, please um, be ready to, to share because that's where we're going to be uh, learning a lot. So you're going to have a lot of those share and learn opportunities. We'll be presenting some case studies uh, and then we'll sum up and hopefully um, engage in questions and answers and a uh, broader conversation after that. Um, the title of this, as it was, um, as, as it was presented um, and advertised, is that this is a workshop. So our goal is not to sit and lecture. Um, and we have this template uh, from um, Slide Carnival. If, by the way, if you ever want uh, good PowerPoint slide templates, just go to slidecarnival.com and they have a lot of free um, slides shows that you can use there. But we chose this one because it has all of these different light bulbs. Um, and light bulbs uh, often have been used as um, a metaphor for ideas. So our hope here is that we'll be sharing with each other, we'll be engaging in conversation, we'll generate ideas and move the conversation forward uh, rather than have the two of us be um, coming to set the agenda and, 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 and be experts on the topic. We wanna be able to engage with everybody on this conversation. Um, so, but, even to, to, to go back a little bit earlier, um, there's a reason, the, the session here was initially uh, titled as Decolonizing Education um, and Cultural Aspects of, uh, Semicolon Cultural Aspect of E-Learning in, in Africa. Um, I spoke about um, my um, issues with the term decolonization, and that's one of the reasons I think we, we dropped it and uh, Wanjira and I had a conversation about this. Um, and I'm, for me personally, I've always have been a little bit uneasy with the term decolonization. Uh, so I just wanted to put that up front because some of you might have um, uh, seen the original uh, labeling or you might have seen some namings before that says decolonization. And if you're coming to this conversation with that perspective in mind, um, I tend not to use that just because for me, I, I'm uneasy about that term. Uh, I don't know yet um, what we mean by that. 
I don't know when we are gonna end decolonization. Uh, I know we have produced a lot of literature and scholarship that talk about the benefits of decolonization, but I have a lot of other questions around the term. So um, I think for the conversation here, we chose to focus much more on, on the cultural aspects of e-learning on the continent rather than the um, use the term decolonization, which is also sort of loaded with a lot of different um, baggage that comes along with it. So just wanted to give that big bit of a background in case you uh, were expecting decolonization to be in the title. So we're gonna start off right away here with some sharing uh, and learning because we want this to be an engaging conversation and, in, uh, and a back and forth uh, uh, engagement. So in the chat, um, or if you want to unmute yourself, uh, the first question that we're going to be really engaging with here is what exactly is culture? So if you want to just type in the chat or if you want to open your, your mic and start sharing, you can do that as well. Um, so the question that we have first here before we even go any further is what exactly is culture? Okay, John Loving here. Can I maybe yes. answer from my side? Please, okay, go ahead. I, I, I believe or, or I, I believe that, that, that culture culture is actually it's 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 norms and values and ide ideologies that was what's that was taken from from our families, our tribes, and our, our people from years ago. And automatically we build a culture around it, values and norms and ideo ideologies, what we learned from them. And that's how I, how I understand and believe what culture is. Great, yeah. And and the the takeaway that I'm having there from what you said is this idea of norms and values. Okay, correct. That's great. I know I'm seeing Shanali's uh, um, contribution. There is an evol an evolving spectrum of norms that frame behaviors. Okay, uh, I like the spectrum aspect of that. Uh, Melissa, cultures, beliefs, values, and traditions. All right, Tony, a set of practices and assumptions. Okay, just maybe a few more seconds. Anybody else wants to contribute to that? Okay. I like the word evolving that Shanali has used. Uh, so yeah. it means it's it's dynamic, it's not static. Mm -hmm. Customary beliefs and norms. Okay. And, and I think from the contribution from everybody, the 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 a few words that are either implicit or explicit, which is beliefs, norms, values. Um and this aspect of uh, dynamism uh, or, or, or dynamic, as uh, uh, Wanjira, you put it. All right. So if we really look at, um, uh, at the definitions that were given, I think it's not much of a stretch to argue that culture is really everything. I don't know anything that exists that's not part of our culture. That's not cultural, right? Um, I think everything is culture. Um, and if we think about it from that perspective, that really everything is culture, then you are faced with the question of that, well, if everything is culture, then why is it in the design of, um, in a design ecosystem broadly and specifically in e-learning, cultures tend to be, the aspect of culture tend to be often ignored or maybe looked at as an afterthought or it's really pushed to the side. So that's sort of the question that we're trying to um, to, to, to grapple with here today, because if we admit that culture is our beliefs, our values, our norms, our practices, our assumptions, um, you know, it, it's embedded in our food, in our languages, in our movement, in everything in the way that we do, if everything there is culture, then why is it when it comes to designing of instruction, 
when it comes to designing of the tools that we use, when it comes to e-learning, when it comes to our own educational practices, when it comes to our education context, if culture is everything, then why is it when we are in that process, we tend to relegate it to the background as an afterthought, right? So I believe that culture is the container in which all learning takes place, right? So it's a container in which all learning takes place. So when you are, or when we end up ignoring the role of culture in the learning process, we're really ignoring a significant aspect uh, um, that can also introduce cognitive noise that impact uh, the learners that we are supposed to be designing for or we're supposed to be teaching. Right. So for the session, for the purpose of this session, we have a few bullets here about um, how you can define culture, right? And as we saw from the uh, from the chat here again, the definition is very broad. Um, and one of the broadest uh, definition, uh, I, we don't have it in here, is that you can even just search uh, um, on your search engine, whether it's Google or, or others, put in culture and UNESCO definition. And it really captures how broad this is. The definition of culture is broad, dynamic, and does not fit all, does not fit all social groups, meaning that not everybody is going to have the same exact definition of what culture is. But for, the, for this discussion, um, culture here is defined as uh, the definitive dynamic purpose and tools, value, ethics, rules, knowledge systems that are developed to attain group goals. Uh, and this definition comes, of course, from the work or influenced by the works of Collins and Mamba Wonku, uh, 1999 and 2003. And I'm probably butchering um, up that last name there. Uh, culture is also viewed as a patterns of thinking, feeling and acting that people display um, as mental programs. And this comes from the work uh, of Ofsted who has um, uh, done a lot of work uh, around uh, the categorization of culture. Um, culture, Cultural groups are also characterized by their cultural products, um, such as skills, artifacts, technologies. Um, and again, here, colors uh, classifies the cultural variables that interact and influence each other on four different levels, uh, which can be societal, personal, organizational, and disciplinary. Right. So why is culture important, again, to, to uh, um, the this, the previous slide here is giving us culture much more in a broader definition. But here, if we look at it from the aspect of, um, or, of this conversation and e-learning, uh, culture is important because it is at the core of what we do and who we are. So as learning continues to be geographically dispersed in various educational settings, in a global workplace, because learning takes place in both formal and informal uh, schooling sectors, but also happens in the organization. Um, as more and more people come into interactions with each other, we really have to take into account the role of culture and the importance of, of culture itself. So with that brief background, let me pause here again and just, um, uh, uh, come back to um, to our conversation of, of of sharing and learning. Uh, when you hear that the idea of designing with culture in mind, what comes to your mind? How do you think we can design with culture in mind? So the question that we have here on the floor is: How do we design with culture in mind? What are some of the ideas that you might have? Again, feel free to just uh, grab the mic or you can chat in the, uh, in the chat window. If, if, as I stated earlier, culture is the container in which all learning takes place and culture is everything. So how do we design with culture in mind? Hi, this is Melissa. I, I think the word that you used that was most 
I was kind of like flipping around in my mind is when you were saying that culture is ignored. Mm -hmm. Um, And what I believe about that is our, you know, culture is so embedded and ingrained into who we are that we are always bringing it into our design process, but maybe not actively identifying in which ways we're bringing it and also not identifying it so that it can be challenged or collaborated with. So when I think about, you know, maybe the first steps in terms of designing with culture in mind, it's not only discussing um, or talking about decisions that are being made, but also like what are the values behind those decisions or the beliefs around how those decisions are going to, you know, either make a difference or, um, or add value. So I think at asking another question around the decisions or even asking different questions that really pertain to what values are we looking to uphold or are we looking to promote through, through the decision-making process and why would we design in this way in order to support those values? Hmm. I, I, the, I really love um, uh, a few of the phrases that you said there. Um, and, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on two. Um, you say that we don't um, really ignore culture. Um, we just sometimes don't identify it. Um, and 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 of course that's my uh, um, my summation of what you said. So I apologize if I'm butchering it. Um, but you're right. Uh, what I what I did not say yet or earlier in the introduction is that there's no such thing as culturally neutral. Right, so I don't think I at least I don't think so. I don't think there's anything that's such as culturally neutral. So if you're designing and you're not identifying the culture that you are having in mind as you're engaging in this design process, I would argue that you're really just choosing the dominant culture. Right, so you're really just not questioning why we're doing the way that we are because you are accepting it as the norm as as normal and something only becomes normal once we have accepted it as is right yes so um so i really like what you're saying there's that it's really about also so if if i can phrase it as an answer how do we design with culture in mind we this we have to ask questions about the decisions that we make so at least that, that's what i was taking away from from your phrase, Melissa, did I, did I put Yes, thank you. Okay. Uh, I also like what Shanali is saying there in the, in, in the chat that designing with culture in mind feels like a balancing act between respect and change. Right, I wonder if uh, Shanali can either say more about that or even type it a, a little bit more. No, I think I think I can say something about that. Please. Um, if I think about, so I work on an online learning design course yeah. and my students come from all over South Africa. And then we usually have uh, a number of students who come to us from the rest of Africa as well. Yeah. And what's always interesting to me is the culture of our course tends towards flattening hierarchies mm. and it tends towards like we want very much to treat our students as colleagues because they are everywhere outside of that classroom. They're the people that we engage with at, at events like this. We see them at conferences. So our classroom culture in that course, uh, virtual and physical tends, we try and lean it towards as flat and as equitable as possible. Um, and what is interesting is that sometimes that is difficult for our students because they're not expecting that from us. Yeah. They're expecting a, 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 a culture where we are very strongly positioned as authoritative experts, knowing, leading them down a particular pathway. Whereas we're more like, well, here's the map. Where would you like to wander? And so like the, the, the culture for us in that space is, or designing that space with the cultures that each of our students come with and that we come with does feel very much like a negotiation. Mm -hmm. 
um, between what is expected and what are we trying to do and what are they trying to do. And so culture for me is a very interesting thing to think about in, in those spaces in that way. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> Um, it does, and I think generally when I when I hear you speak, one of the things that keeps coming into my mind is this idea of disrupting an established culture. And what I mean by that is that we are all um, sort of accustomed to the the teacher or the designer or the the, in, the the instructor, the professor, having all the answers and telling us exactly what we're going to be doing uh, from the beginning to the end. Right? We have a syllabus that outlines everything that we're doing. And when you come to the class, you have all of that already predetermined for you. Very rarely, or rather it's only very recently that we are being asked, you know, like you, you said, you, you treat the student as the colleagues. Um, and not many people are used to that yet. Right. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm hearing a notion of disruption of, 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 of this culture. And I also like the comment that you have in the chat there about um, makes designing with culture in mind in a multicultural space like South Africa very interesting. Um, and, 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 and I would, I would argue, I'm, I'm, I'm in Namibia right now and we face the same exact thing. We have multiple cultures um, and multiple ethnic groups that have a lot of different subcultures. So trying to design in that context where you have uh, a multiplicity of cultures and subcultures becomes very, um, uh, uh, very interesting indeed. So anybody else there about how do we design um, with culture in mind? I like Eunice's uh, concept of co-designing with the students. Okay. So um, why is this conversation important? Why should instructional designers or learning designers be prepared and aware of culture when it comes to e-learning? You know, I, I think it's important because um, we need to be able to, or rather what, what some of the work that we do is that we identify tools and strategies um, that we share with our uh, either students, or if you're a traditional ID, you might have to share that with a um, subject matter expert or the instructor. So it's necessary to be able to provide tools and strategies that enable the design of learning that is culturally aware, right? So you can't provide design of learning experiences that are culturally aware if you yourself are not culturally aware, if you yourself are not uh, aware of the importance of um, culture plays. Uh, and we're talking about, uh, as Shanali said there, about the multicultural uh, space in which we exist in, which here um, in our presentation, we're talking about the diversity of learners. Uh, our learners are very, very diverse um, uh, in terms of how they like to receive instruction, in terms of the realities that they face at home, in terms of the societies in which they come from, they all have different worldviews um, and, and we need to be able to respect that and recognize that. Uh, so we need to be able to create culturally responsive and appropriate learning environments. And for me, you can't create appropriate learning environments without taking culture in mind. So the, the, the broader question here uh, for this session again is if practitioners, researchers, and educators, if we all do indeed value culture and want to integrate culture holistically in a design process, then how do we do it, right? So if the first few slides uh, I spend setting up the stage and saying culture is crucial, if we all now agree that, okay, as practitioners, researchers, educators, and design and designers, we do indeed value culture and want to integrate culture um, holistically. If we want to be able to value culture holistically in our design process, then how do we do it? That I think becomes really um, the challenge. And I don't think there is one simple way of doing that. I think there's a there are multiple ways, and I think as um, we, uh, we all develop and as we all engage in, uh, in the design processes, we come up with our own ways of doing that. 
Um, there's a few models that are out there in the literature um, that specifically focus on um, designing with uh, uh, culture in mind. Um, there's a national cultural dimension. Um, there's a amoeba design framework, the cultural adaptation process and the culture-based model. Um, I don't have, I wasn't going to go in depth about all of those, but I'll just really briefly talk about them. Um, so the national cultural dimension, um, this is one of, um, uh, this is based on, uh, uh, on, on Hof Hofstede's uh, work, uh, I believe uh, 1986 and 2011 is the one that um, I'm most familiar with. And Hofstede there really does um, this divide up or categorizes uh, cultures in uh, multiple groupings. Um, you might be familiar with some of his work where um, this idea that cultures can be categorized in terms of power distance. Um, they can either be also individualistic or collectivist, um, masculine or feminine. Um, some cultures are, uh, are high on uncertainty avoidance, um, some on indulgence versus restraint, uh, long-term versus short-term orientation. So uh, if you're not familiar with this, I think this is a really good model that uh, I would argue is more effective at grouping cultures um, that you should be familiar with. I'm not so certain that it's the best uh, model to look at when we come to learning and e-learning design, but it is um, a good categorization uh, model that is worth of, of, of looking at. Uh, the other one is the uh, Amoeba uh, design framework uh, that is from uh, uh, Gunwar Dena, Wilson, and Nola. I'll, I'll type the, the citation here in the chat if anybody wants to, um, to look at it. Right, and, and, and this model has, um, it's, uh, presents six different components for designers to look at when we're thinking about design with culture in mind. And the, art, the authors here argue that um, you need to take into account language, the format of the communication channel, the different activities that you're, um, that you're presenting your learners, the methods that you're presenting those activities, and the different knowledges that you are expecting uh, uh, your learners to have. Um, the cultural adaptation model, model which is from uh, Edmondson. Edmondson 2007. This is the cultural adaptation uh, model. So you can look that up. Um, and it's used really as a guide uh, to a consistent analytical process, uh, but it's not really designed to be um, a model that can help people um, uh, develop cultural expertise. Uh, and Edmondson here really says that you first start with design and develop in one culture, and then you change um, and you add different accents to whatever design that you're creating, and then you implement that into another culture. So Edmondson argued that, for example, I can design um, uh, with a, a culture in Namibia in mind, and then as I go on to another culture, um, I add on different elements that are, uh, are particular to the next culture and keep continuing to add, add, and, 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 and devolve um, to that. Uh, and then the other last model that I just wanted to chat here is um, the culture-based model. Um, if you have come to a lot of eMERGE uh, sessions before, you might be familiar with uh, Dr. Patricia Young uh, at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, she came up with uh, the culture-based model, which have multiple components that instruction designers can go through um, to guide them about how to design with, uh, with culture in mind. So again, these are just four models, but there are multiple 
that you can look at um, in terms of how to design with, uh, with culture in mind. So culture of technology and e-learning. E-learning design is influenced by the cultural features which um, form um, the context in which learning process takes place. So as I said earlier again here is that, um, you know, culture is the container in which e-learning is taking place, in which all learning is taking place. So e-learning design itself is actually influenced by those cultural features. So as I, I alluded to earlier by the Hofstede um, uh, model, um, here, if you have a culture that is uh, viewed as individualistic or collective, that is going to be influenced in the type of e-learning that you design, or at least it should. Um, cultural features do influence technology, uh, digital uh, internet behaviors, uh, and so on. So the usage um, of, of the tools, the uses of the models, adopting different language um, that uh, 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 are not really ours, the role the instructor uh, uh, plays, as we talked about earlier, that some students are much more uh, accustomed to the idea of coming to a course that is already fully built, um, whereas some of us like to have much more of a co-design relationship with our, um, with, uh, with our learners. So, but really the, the one that I wanna focus on here is this idea of the usage and, and the adoption of language, because a lot of the models and theories that we use on the African continent, I would argue are not really of our own. So I would have to adopt those. When I was studying for my master's to become an instruction designer, the term that I had the most difficulty with is scaffolding, right? Um, it's a term that is used across uh, instructional design, across education, but the way that it was explained to me was that the teacher used a metaphor of a scaffold that is used to build a skyscraper. And, and for some reason, I just had a really mental block of that because I didn't grow up in a community that had skyscrapers. So I really couldn't understand that uh, um, metaphor of, of, of linking scaffolding to, um, uh, uh, um, scaffolding to skyscrapers, tall buildings. And it wasn't until later somebody, uh, um, I, I was writing a, a book chapter with my PhD advisor and I dug in further about scaffolding where the original example was actually of a parent helping a child learn how to walk, right? That they, the kid is, 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 is being held up by both two hands as they are walking by a parent. And more and more as the kid grows, the kid figure out a way to walk on their own and so on. And I thought that that uh, example of scaffolding was much more natural to me because cross-culturally, all kids need to learn how to walk. So that, that metaphor for me was a bit more easier to grasp and to digest than this idea of, uh, 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 of, of um, scaffolding and building skyscrapers. So again, here, I'm just trying to illustrate that um, a culture, there are cultural features that influence all of these digital technologies that we use. And some of them come in embedded with um, definitions uh, an explanation and metaphors that are that might not be as common to the culture in which we are designing in. So when we talk about um, design and the curriculum here, there is this notion of the curriculum and um, and the hidden curriculum. And I think um, Wanjira, usually you, you do a great job of summing this up. So I'm going to Take a stab at this and please feel free to, um, to, to, to jump in at any point. Um, when we think about the curriculum, we all tend to talk about the roadmap, uh, right? So uh, the plan for learning, the plan that a student has to go through to get a certain qualification, right? It includes what, why, how, when, and who, uh, and often in relation to design and delivery of the program and module, right? There's a curriculum in place for the Bachelor of Science. There's a curriculum in place for the Bachelor in Education and so on. But there's also this idea of the hidden curriculum, which for me is really where this idea of culture comes in. This culture is often invisible, right? And the hidden culture or rather hidden curriculum refers to 
the unwritten, the unofficial, and the often unintended lessons and values and perspective that students learn in school, right? Um, uh, and, and some of those I just picked up in terms of observations and behaviors and the norms that we've already uh, created in our um, in our uh, in our learning spaces, right? So if you're a teacher who teaches a class and has already established that the class that is online starts on Monday and students have the whole week to engage and then they submit their work in uh, on Sunday, right? That is, uh, could be a curriculum that you have um, uh, uh, officially um, laid out as a map and it's visible to all your learners. But there's a lot of other unwritten, unofficial aspect of that, right? That are informal um, uh, and often unintentional, but they are taught in our school. Uh, some of this can also relate to expectations we have of gender, right? Expectations we have of language, uh, certain vernaculars that we use um, in in our um, uh, in in our day to day conversation with our students, certain behaviors, morals, and so forth. So there is this part of a, a, um, a visible curriculum that we all know and can point to, but also this aspect of um, the hidden curriculum that uh, we are not necessarily um, uh, verbalizing and showing to everybody. So. Let me pause here and, and just pause on this idea of the hidden curriculum because it also influences the way we design um, and, 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 and our design decisions and choices. So when you think about this idea of the hidden curriculum, do you have any examples of a hidden curriculum that maybe exists in your practice or at your institution? Again, feel free to just chime in with uh, your chat or, or, or grab the mic. But here is an example of uh, the curriculum and what we'll um, call here the hidden curriculum. So what are some examples of hidden curriculum in your own setting? All right, Rusula, you're talking about um, uh, some values such as independent working. Yep. Uh, I think participation is really one of those that uh, is a hidden curriculum because often it looks so different to everybody. Uh, and, um, you know, I would argue that sometime even the person who's sitting silently they are participating, right? Economic system, capitalism. Tony, I, I definitely uh, um, see that. And I think that it really does impact, especially us, uh, the students who we come into our learning spaces. Uh, and if, if each student is expected to come to school with a laptop, and their economic uh, situation does not allow them to do that. Um, I, I would argue that that's also another aspect of uh, the hidden uh, issues that are, that are impacting the curriculum. Please, if, if, I'm, if I'm reading back your, um, your comments and I'm completely messing up the idea that you have, please jump in and just uh, correct me. The role of the, edu of the educator in the classroom right? The tone. Tone is really one of those because um, someone can say that you sound angry and upset when you're not at all. Uh, or students could be turned off by the way you say something um, and they're interpreting um, your tone to mean something that you do not, right? Technological competencies. We used to talk a lot about um, this idea of uh, digital natives and uh, digital immigrants. And I'm really excited and happy that we are moving more and more away from those because those them terms themselves also are part of this hidden curriculum because they're embedded within them 
um, assumptions that are not necessarily reliable or sensical. Information literacy, okay. All right. Yeah. Respect for students, creating spaces for students. Very many. So it sounds like we, we have uh, very many different ideas of this aspect, the hidden curriculum. Um, I, would ex I would probably extend this a little bit more when it comes to e-learning and um, argue that maybe there is some aspect of hidden designs, some embedded things in the designs that uh, of our learning uh, environments that are hidden um, and, 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 and they're basically based on our culture and our understanding and the way that we view the world, right? So I'm going to pause here and stop hugging the mic and uh, uh, pass it on to, to Anjira to perhaps talk a little bit about this conceptual framework. All right, thank you very much to Teleni and everyone for um, all your comments and your observations on how we think about culture as we design. And what I like about it is you've already uh, come ahead of me and started to see some of the things that we have in mind. Uh, one of the things um, to Teleni and I talked about were we've read so many articles, seen so many videos, had so much about what's not working, what works, uh, where uh, African countries fall when it comes to certain aspects. And most of the time, um, it turns out to be not always a positive note. So we said, we know there's many things that are happening on the continent that we sometimes don't uh, pat ourselves on the back for. So for this uh, remaining segment, we just wanted to focus on really what elements are happening that we can uh, talk about. So when we said uh, framework, it's really more to guide that conversation rather than to look for what's not working. So we will talk about some of that necessarily in the conversation, but just uh, as a broad uh, introduction, we already have talked about the, the factors, uh, the cultural factors, the gender bias and the cultural biases and the language barriers, which uh, uh, Tutelini mentioned uh, at the beginning what's happening when it comes to what um, issues could be happening more from an economic and political perspective that may or may not make that work as well as we would. But all put together, you, as you can see from this framework here, it leads more towards uh, developing online learning and e-learning. So from that perspective, if we solve some of those issues or at least address them, then we can start to build capacity, uh, capability, which is an outcome. So we are looking at what the inputs are, uh, what the source is and what the outcomes will be. So as, I, as you see the next few slides, when we talk about the particular cases, uh, just keep that in mind as we work through the different aspects, because I think uh, many of us, we know what the challenges might be, but um, beyond dealing with the challenges, how can we then make this a more effective application of what we know and the, use the knowledge that we have to make uh, instruction work a little bit better? So if we can go to the next slide. Um, okay, Tutelini. I think it's, is it frozen? Uh, Tutelini, the next slide, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you very much. Um, so I want to just frame this in a little bit of our, we, we used a reflection case study approach to do this, where uh, for somebody like myself, being in academia, but also doing a lot of uh, work uh, with different organizations in consultancy and other things, it's given me a somewhat different perspective of uh, how we approach it in the classroom and what we find when we go to an environment where some of those things are applicable and some are not. But I just wanna give a background for this particular case one, uh, which I call the social cultural perspective. So what happened was, uh, when I was at Georgia State, I looked at the curriculum and I thought, you know, there's all the theory, there's all the how-tos, but then 
how are we addressing the specifics of how we actually can infuse the culture, the social elements of learning in a particular program. So to do that, students would have had to take maybe a course in a sociology of education or philosophy of education, which are not necessarily always embedded in a, in a curriculum of a master's or a PhD program, unless the student takes those as extras. But I said, let's think about how we can do this. So two, two ways this was done. I got a little grant from uh, the university system, very small. And that was uh, many years back. But thinking about how to do that was a challenge because where was the starting point? We looked at some of the models that Tutelini has uh, talked about. And I said, let me see how we can do this and develop a course or courses that address some of these elements. So one was an undergraduate course, and I'll share a little bit more about that. And then the other one was a graduate level course, which was more of a survey uh, course. So just over the years, I've gone back and forth. I still teach the class this many years later, every summer, actually it starts on Monday. And I think about certain aspects of how this can be done. So for me, in this particular case, which is the undergraduate course, I call it the ed educational technology in Africa and the diaspora. So what came out of that was when I'm on this side of the world, how do I teach it? What does it look like? When I'm teaching the class and I'm on the other side of the world, exactly what does that look like? So looking at that comparatively has actually helped me. And Jacob and I were talking about this earlier. When you're on one side, what does it feel like? Uh, when you're on the continent, what examples can you give? What practical examples are students able to come up with? One of the things I frequently do is I start out, even before we get into the technology, we start to demystify and understand ourselves. So we start with the, um, the uh, talking about what are the stereotypes that we have about each other. So I have them look at articles, I have them watch videos and they reflect on them. And then by the time they're done, I think one of the big uh, takeaways that I get is we, we actually not that different. And I think that's a ice breaking. And, you know, when, again, when you talk about cost design, uh, the question that Tutelini posed earlier, how do we do that? How do we break that ice to then get into the difficult topics? So now moving on to the other course, which was more on the graduate level where the discussions are a little bit more deep, just as we said earlier that uh, some of these terms are difficult to either understand, conceptualize, um, put in our own frame, like decolonization. There are topics on social cultural issues that are going to evoke personal views. So what, you know, like the one on just what are the stereotypes we have about each other. But once you understand them, guess what? There's a lot of things that come from countries that you may never have heard of, but they are products that are, um, are solving problems at a local level and now even at a global level in some cases. So that's one of the ways that I have been fused that are specifically in a course. So that's just a one or two courses. But beyond that, when teaching a class, regardless of what the, um, the content is, I think it's important for us to sometimes think about it in either soft or very deliberate terms, bringing in those issues that we termed as the hidden curriculum. How do we engage students when we do that? And I'll use another example where I, there's a certain classes that I teach, uh, but because of personal and religious aspects, there's certain ways that I can only group students. And let me say, unfortunately, the curriculum is not set by me. Um, it's approved by a board. So there's only so much flexibility that I can have when I say, group project or no group project because that's been approved at the uh, board, uh, the university board level. One example I, I'll share is um, one of the requirements for that course, uh, which I did not design, but I teach, requires students to work in groups. And most times when I teach that class, it's mostly female students, uh, actually 98% of the times, but there was one or two times when there was a male student uh, that was in the class and he was the only one. And I had to put them in groups. But in putting them in groups, uh, a female student wrote me and said, I'm sorry, but I, I cannot work with him. And I said, I, I don't understand why. He said, she said, for personal reasons, I cannot be grouped with a male student. So that put me in a really hard dilemma because she had her reasons why, uh, personal or religious. I don't, she didn't specify which one, but it made me think about, again, 
going back to that element of when you design a class and you have some things that are very rigid and you have very little flexibility, but it has an impact on the grades, how do we approach that? I can say that I had very little to work with in that particular situation. So the best I could do was just bring it to the attention of the department chair and say, this is the situation and advise me on how to, to do that. So those are some of the things we are saying are, they're hidden in the curriculum. And if we are not aware of them, it changes how we choose to address a fact. But if I had just said, I don't care, this is it, it's the curriculum, it's set, then it will disadvantage one student over the other. So I try and apply to the extent possible things that are relevant uh, in these particular cases. And then I make it uh, flexible in the sense that the students can then come back and say, okay, this actually was re relevant. It was useful to me or it wasn't. And then, you know, so again, we said at the beginning, culture is dynamic and so are the classes we teach. They should be uh, flexible to the extent possible so that students can feel that they are part of that learning experience. So the second case uh, to Teleni uh, is, um, is actually a co conglomeration or bits and pieces of some of the projects that I've worked on where we have seen that um, when we are doing faculty development, certain things have to be taken in mind. So while I've been back on this side of the world, um, certain projects uh, might look almost similar to something I'm doing on the other side, but not necessarily because th the circumstances are different. Um, maybe institutions on the other side might be able to afford uh, more resources. Maybe their learning management systems are proprietary and they, they do have the budget for that. What I found that works here, um, again, we could have another whole conversation on open educational resources and open uh, software. Uh, and I know that's already uh, been done to an extent, but what does that mean in terms of providing access to institutions and the, 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 the support that will be available for them? But even beyond that, we know students learn differently or have different uh, reasons why they want to use a certain uh, option versus another. So multimedia, for instance, uh, we like to use that because it's very flexible. It shows students that they can see the information in one way or the other. But sometimes we also have to think beyond that and think, are they going to be able to access it? So the bandwidth issue, which I think uh, some of us already have uh, thought about, to me, that's uh, in a sense a cultural issue because it brings, it can even bring up uh, issues of socioeconomic or sociocultural. So when you design that, what are the options for saying, okay, there will be a student who can download, cannot download a video. What is the alternative for them? The, the, those are the kinds of uh, situations that I, I think about that should be in, in, integrated into a course uh, or into a training experience or an e-learning development uh, uh, opportunities. So that recognition that everybody will come in differently uh, you're not going to be able to control all the circumstances, but I think we can control what is within our reach, with either as the instructional designer or as a tech support or the facilitator who's doing that. So as you're doing that, I've seen situations where um, the learning is almost 100% dependent on open resources. But then we find, as we'll see in a little bit in one of the other cases, that the open resources sometimes are have their own things that we need to work through so that we can develop something that works a little bit more uh, flexibly for everybody. So in the third case, and as I mentioned, some of these um, cases are not one case, but I've thought about how we can combine the different um, learnings that we have from the different projects. And I think it was uh, Eunice earlier that talked about co-creation. So I like that that came up earlier. Uh, one of the things, uh, and I think to Teleni, you mentioned this, is the, the culture of sharing and the culture of students uh, being told, it's okay, you can be part of this collaborative process. That might be new to some people. So how you introduce it really makes a difference on how successful you are. I'll give another example. When I was teaching, a, I think it was a master's class early, early on, and I, it was a short summer class. And I said, some of these students will go on to become PhD students. So let's start giving them the experience of being teaching assistants. So we split up the responsibility of the class and maybe one week somebody would do, maybe mind the discussion forums, one would do the chapter presentation, one would be in charge of you know, finding the resources. But then, the first time I did it, it didn't go so well. 
because uh, the interpretation was, why are we doing the work when you're the one supposed to be the teacher? So it had to be um, a process of us looking at it beyond the class. At some point, you'll be an, a designer. At some point, you'll be um, a, a teacher in a classroom. At some point, you'll be part of an instructional design team. So how do all these things come to play? So that initial uh, development of co-creating started to work out a little bit better. But I think just took that initial understanding of, no, I'm not offloading the responsibility to you. It's about sharing and thinking beyond that, because those are some of the experiences. If you go to do an internship, this is what somebody might uh, ask you to do if this is not something you've done in uh, previously. So I think co-creation is uh, wonderful of resources, whether it's OER, developing and revising and sharing them. And as we've seen uh, over and over, there are resources, but they might not always fit. And this is how we start to develop and then share things and bring them out to others to also be part of that, that development. And I think there's a, a degree and a sense of motivation if you look and see that you contributed to something, just like Tutelani was talking about co-authoring as a PhD student uh, with his uh, supervisor. So, you know, that development from a very early onset then starts to change the way that we think about how we can be co-producing some of these resources. Now, in the next um, case, um, um, this is something, as I said, uh, Tutelani and I work on certain projects and we see some of this happening. Uh, there's a lot of projects we've seen around the universities and it goes alongside the co-creation uh, aspect where people are coming together. Uh, if you look on the left side of the screen, I've put there the issues that might be of a challenge, but how do we on the right side look at that and say, this is how we can work together to do that. So when it comes to things that are sometimes beyond the scope or the um, um, the extent of which facilitators might uh, be working with, this is where these organizations come in handy. So we say, let's push policy, let's push frameworks, let's push technology. Uh, a single institution might not be able to do that, but uh, as a co collaborative aspect and people coming together, we're finding more and more um, organizations coming together able to push policy that is able to do that. And I think we saw that quite a bit in the last two years where uh, the example of Kenya, you know, people coming together and then being able to get the uh, mobile uh, companies provide a data to the schools. That might not have happened if one school walked into uh, the, the telecom and, and said, well, this is what we need. But when they come together, they're able to push for rates, able to push for access. So those are some of the projects that we've seen where you can plan on a macro level, but also have the specific learners in mind. So in the case of curriculum development, you are then able to then say, we've got this, this school is developing this, this organization is developing this, let's push it out with the support of particular organizations. And in the next case study, um, still part of that development with the uh, collaborations and, and institutions coming together, we've seen communities of practice uh, developing. Uh, I see we in this room at this time doing exactly that, developing that community of practice. And something else that comes to mind is not just learner centeredness, but learning centeredness. And the reason I say this is because we often think of learner centered as the student in the classroom, but what about the instructor or the person who's going to be tasked with being the trainer who trains the others? So developing some of that skill set at the onset and becoming a, a universal uh, group of having the resources available together helps us develop that. And I was just thinking of just two examples, uh, three examples actually here. Um, the last three that you see there, we've talked about the hidden curriculum does exist. So we acknowledge that and we start to say on a personal level, how can I change this? How do I stop addressing uh, one student as Mr. and the other one as on their first name basis? How can we not, why do not we not equalize everybody either first name basis or last name basis? So those are the little, oh, let me call them little, but those are the things that sometimes we make assumptions about, but they send a message. When we are developing curricula for um, train the trainers in some of these projects I've been working on, what I've seen sometimes is some of these uh, elements are afterthoughts, just like we talked about culture at the beginning. 
you have uh, something in mind, but let's do the, 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 let's do the curriculum and then we'll bring in the culture. Let, and then we'll think about the gender and then we'll think about uh, access issues. One of the things that we found in some of the projects was when you do that, it, it almost mentally creates a, a separation where uh, when you set maybe a gender module aside from the actual curriculum itself. So that's why going back to case one, I, I said, let, let's think about how we start infusing this. We're not going to be able to infuse everything, but if you start building in small blocks, bring that consciousness to the forefront, that then starts to say, these things are not separate. This is how you bring these elements together. We did have a situation uh, which made us rethink some of the training where, okay, we've got all these uh, wonderful resources. Everything is on Moodle. And then we get a student uh, or a participant who is visually uh, impaired. They couldn't read any of it. So we have to go back to the drawing board and think, okay, so how else can we make sure that this participant is um, already taken care of from the beginning, not as at the end during the process. So that's what we mean by saying you're streamlining and you're mainstreaming everything into the curriculum, not as an afterthought, but as part of the, the development of the curriculum itself and also the instructional design process. So, and that starts to put us in a situation where we can talk to each other and build up uh, the questions about what should be addressed when we talk about certain topics and how we bring them to the forefront uh, when we're building the communities of practice. So I, I have, I think, just one or two more cases. Uh, the next one is, um, and I've kind of talked about this just briefly in uh, case one. So in developing the classes, how do you make this uh, learning experience more authentic? How students actually see this in themselves and how they think about uh, their own learning. So these are some of the examples, I think um, just for time's sake, we won't get through all of them, but we found this to be quite um, helpful. Uh, you know, somebody might say, oh, but that is that not more work for the instructor? It is more work. So that's what we acknowledge at the beginning, but are, are we just teaching to tick things off the checklist, but, or do we actually want to make this impactful? in how we address it. So your e-portfolio is your story. So nobody will change that. So Wanjira is not going to come and give you an A or a B or a C. It's your story. That's your authentic experience. No one takes away from that. Using cases and problem-based situations where they're actually able to draw from their own work and learning experiences is actually very, very important uh, to doing that. So, and even just, as I mentioned, some topics are difficult to address, but I feel it's uh, still important to include them when we do discussions on, on some of these topics. So the, the very last one, uh, just to revisit uh, OER, is uh, in library resources. Uh, and this is a project from a number of years back where we were looking to see what uh, resources are available and how we can and find and, and use them. So this links back to what we mentioned about co-creation, uh, the issues that we experienced, but in keeping all that in mind, we know that there are things that we can do. So, you know, what are the reading lists like? Are they accessible? Um, if you are talking about gender, for example, who are your authors? Is it a balance? What side of the globe do they come from? Who are the contributors? Uh, when we say open access journals, are they actually truly open access or there is limitations and restrictions on what you can do. So what we found in this particular study was um, sometimes you start small, uh, small works well, and then that small group and another small group come together. And this is again where all these different organizations have come together and said, you're doing this, we are doing something similar, let's bring something together. And I think that's where we start to find that the resources come together and we start building that community. And so we, we then end up looking at some of these things, not just as individual elements, as I said, these are cases, but they're not individual cases in that sense. They're different aspects based on some of the projects we've been working on to, uh, to bring that out uh, to the front. Now, I just wanted to close this before I share the summary with an example of um, something. It's okay to tell you, you can see on the summary slide. Um, something that just two, two little anecdotes, if you bear with me. So one was when I was an undergraduate student and I was taking a math class and I always confess, I'm not a very strong mathematics student. And what made it more difficult for me was 
the textbook we were using. And I think this is what started to bring out some of this uh, to my uh, conscious. It was a class on probability and the, the examples just didn't work for me. Um, being asked uh, about baseball and, and card games, which were very unfamiliar to me being in a new uh, context. And I, I didn't do well, and not because I couldn't understand the concepts, but those examples were very removed from what I was familiar with. So I just wanted to mention that because Tutalini, you said something uh, unrelated to that earlier on. And then many years later, I met uh, a very, very tall man. He must have been seven, uh, I think seven feet, very tall. And he said something, and this happened to be at actually an instructional design a conference and he's, he gave the example of, um, he, he's, he, he lives in America. So wherever he went, everybody asked him, um, do you play basketball? That's the question everybody used to ask him. Then it turned out that some years uh, later, he was, uh, on a, I think he was a missionary in Portugal. And the question he got asked was, do you pick olives? So I always think about that, you know, context is so, so crucial when we think about uh, how we design. So in one context, he's a basketball player because he's tall. In another, he's tall. Therefore, he must be in the business of picking olives. So those are some of the things that we think about uh, when we are designing, uh, when you're thinking about changes that we are making to our curriculum and how we approach that. So we mentioned here um, the colonization, we didn't get into so much of that discussion, but we just wanted to say, just like the, the way we look at culture, it's a process, not an, uh, it's not an event. And the more we think about bridging uh, inequalities, that's how we're able to then bring in the dynamics of who's able to do what and what the kind of power that they have to do that. So I'll stop there. And I think uh, Tony or Jacob will tell us if we still have time for a little bit more Q&A uh, before we close. So thank you for that. Well, gosh, thank you so much, Tutuleni and Wanjira. Um, it does seem interesting that almost everybody who could stay has actually stayed, even though we are currently 13 minutes over time. Um, so perhaps there might be time for one or two questions if people want to stick around a little bit more. Um, I see Irene has posted the link to the feedback form in the chat. We do like getting feedback and getting a sense of how people experience our events. I just want to say, in terms of the thanks, I love the way that you both highlighted the complexity and the dynamism of culture and shared some very deep and compassionate thinking about helpful approaches to addressing cultural issues and differences in the design of e-learning, um, including, I would expect, blended learning. Um, Wanjira, thank you for those wonderful examples at the end. It was like one for each day of the week. And each of these could by itself be the topic of a webinar of its own. And strung together, they could be the basis for an entire course. So thank you for sharing um, a bit of those examples with us. Um, and I think we're going to have some, have some conversation with you after this about what more we can do with those examples. And thank you to both of you for engaging us in a stimulating conversation where you asked questions of participants and gave space for participant voices. So now, um, if anyone wants to, has a question um, or a comment, please feel free to come in, just switch on your microphone and talk to us, please. Okay. There's an interesting comment here from um, Ursula, who loved the examples and says, came to this following a webinar on self-directed learning spoke to many of our assumptions about learning and the hidden curriculum involved in self-directed learning. And Eunice says, thank you for showing how to integrate these issues in curriculum. Anyone want to take the mic? You're so welcome to do that. Or um, we can bounce back to Tutleni and Wanjira for 
a closing comment. Okay, Tutelani. I just say again, thank you everybody for um, for being here, um, and and this is a continuing conversation um, on 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 how to integrate uh, and recognize culture in all of our uh, in all of our practices. So I learned a lot from the sharing that um, everybody um, uh, participated in uh, today. So thank you. And I'd uh, like to Tulani, um, 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 I always appreciate these uh, conversations. They really stimulate and make, get me thinking. And I'm, I, I just like any teacher, we don't come into the room with all the answers. So that sends us back home to think through some of this or think about solutions. So the idea that we have these situations and we can continue the conversations, I think is very important. And just one more thing that I just as I emphasized in one of the classes I teach, one course is not enough. It, it isn't enough. So in the same way that um, Tony said it, uh, one webinar is not enough and there's many things we can dissect and look at uh, different aspects of this experience. Thank, so you, thank you very you. much to both of you and uh, Wanjira. Um, this goes back to a conversation that I was having with Irene um, a couple of months ago where she was saying that she and another member of our facilitation team, Ralitza, had been talking about the importance of culture and that maybe we need a whole series on culture. So there you are. I think we might get that, Irene. Um, Eunice, your hand is up. Thank you, Tony. Th uh, thank you, Tony, and uh, good afternoon, colleagues. And... Uh, uh, Wanjira and uh, Tutaleni, thank you so much for a very inspiring uh, presentation. It's something I've been thinking about it and uh, actioning it is a real issue. I just want to know how you deal with the, the issue of resistance when you start introducing this, these things, because one of the things which comes up is that uh, uh, if I start uh, taking into consideration all these things, I'm not going to finish the curriculum. And if I don't finish the curriculum, I'm trouble with management, uh, student fail, and you know, all those kinds of things. Thank you. Um, oh, go ahead, Tutelani. Okay. Oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, what I was, I think, um, Eunice, thank you very much for that question. Um, and I've I've gotten that question before from from other people as well. My response has usually been the same. Um, I don't think this process asks us to do anything more than what we would normally do. And here's an example: um, if if you're teaching a course and you have to give examples about, let's say, uh, let's say you ask you're giving a you're teaching a class on mechanics, right, on on engineering and so forth. And in that class, you already have to use examples that are demonstrating some concept in practice. So designing with culture in mind or, uh, or taking culture into that specific context would just mean instead of using an example about um, men, for example, then use an example about women. Instead of using a, uh, um, uh, a picture of um, of boys playing in the snow um, from North America and you're teaching a course in Namibia, maybe use kids in the village uh, as, a, as, as a picture of that. So it's, it wouldn't be, for me, it wouldn't really necessarily be doing, um, having to take on additional stuff. It's really just, uh, and, and it was said earlier at the beginning, it's about thinking and asking about the design choices that you're already making. Because you have to create questions already. You have to create lessons already. You have to use pictures already. You have, you have to use examples already. But the question is, what pictures are you using? What examples are you offering? Um, what texts are you integrating? And all of these type of things. So it wouldn't necessarily be having to do um, additional stuff. It's really more about thinking critically about what you're already doing. So, so, sorry, Wendy, so um, if I may ask uh, uh, another question, Tony. So why do we call it uh, culture? Why can't we just call it contextualization? Because 
contextualization, you look at all those issues uh, you are giving me as examples and all that. Thank you. That's a really good question and a hard one. Um, for and, and, and anybody else can come in for, for this, but for me, I don't know how you can contextualize without culture. Um, I think that, that that's the, the other part. I think contextualization sometimes uh, the way that it has been done, um, or at least what I have seen people do, it, it doesn't go farther enough. Uh, it basically says, okay, well, um, I'm going to contextualize this design by making sure that it runs more um, effectively on a mobile device than on something else, because in this community, people are using um, uh, uh, mobile devices. You can still contextualize the technology an example, but not necessarily taking into account the full culture of it. I think for me personally, context is part of culture, but culture is still the main and larger container. Wanjir, I don't know if you want to come in on this. Yes, in fact, I was just going to say, you've just taken the words I was going to use, <laughs> but I, 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 that's because we have the same brain. And I was just thinking back to what you you said earlier about culture being everything. So just that way of our own framing, our own understanding, our, our own um, use of the language that best fits what we are, we are doing. I think that's, to me, the first step. So sometimes we, and I can understand where sometimes administratively or managerial wise, we get stuck on semantics. But to me, it's exactly what uh, Eunice is saying. So why can't we just call it what it is? And that's what I would do. And sometimes you find um, situations that could be easily or less uh, resolved with less difficulty, but because we are labeling them certain things, it becomes more difficult to make a change. So with the examples that uh, Tutalini said, you know, just the language that we are using in the classroom, uh, that is within our control. So having that in your control makes it easier for you to make that uh, let me call it small change because many small changes make big change. But if many of us do that, then we start to change the way we are thinking about things. So I'll go back to the example of um, mainstreaming a curriculum. And when it's offered one way, uh, where you say it's a module in a course, there's nothing wrong with having it as a module. But another way to do that is when you're designing maybe uh, a module or needs assessment and how you frame the questions and how you write them and how you take into consideration things like technology or access or lack thereof. And you start building those in. I think that makes it a little bit more palatable for somebody who might say, no, this is fluffy because that's the other thing we get is that's fluffy. How are we going to address this? Or how are we, that's intangible. How, you, how are you going to make sense of it? So I think that to me would be something that uh, is, partially at least within our control as designers or facilitators or uh, support when it comes to uh, ICT. Tutalini and Wanjira, you are sparking so many more thoughts. Um, we could so easily, if people were willing, just keep going for another two or three hours, or we could decide to formally adjourn and um, under more face-to-face -face circumstances, we would then just go and sit and continue the conversation in the ca cafe or the canteen. I'm sorry we don't have such a space available right now. Um, yes, basically um, we can share the contacts for Tutaleni and for Wanjira. Um, perhaps um, we could just put them into the chat here and I would like to ask if we can actually adjourn now, um, or if there is um, a desire to continue the conversation over um, the next few hours from the people in the room, and, and especially from Tutuleni and Wanjira. Or if you'll stay for supper, you know? I think uh, out of respect for everybody's time, uh, <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank because you. Because we could go on for a few more hours, but um, uh, Eunice's uh, comment is, is a great one. It would be interesting to have a session at some point that examines the difference between 
context and culture, if there is any, or the interconnectedness of those two in the design processes. So, but thank you, everybody. Thank you. Manjira. Thank you, everyone. Okay, a final round of applause. And I think we're going to stop the recording.